Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and, well, I'm sorry for the long hiatus, I got really sick after, well, while I was on vacation. But, back in the news today, NASA had a big announcement about oceans, other oceans in the solar system, and I thought it would be a perfect excuse to talk about it. And since I like to do video games, uh, yeah, I thought I'd show you them in Elite Dangerous, which did just release their Commander's update. Although, to be fair, everything I show you here was already in previous updates. It's just an excuse to visit part of the solar system that are part of the elite universe to show you some real science. So Europa is, of course, around Jupiter. It's the second Galilean moon. In terms of size, Europa is about the same size as our own moon, although it is less massive. Now, if you have the pass in Elite Dangerous to visit the solar system, you can go to Europa and there is actually a landmark on the surface, which a tourist, a tourist landmark, which you can fly to and it's very convenient because it will show you where these ice geysers are. Now the specific NASA news today was about uh, more Hubble Space Telescope observations of Europa. It's uh, not the first time that they've observed geysers or jets coming off of the surface of Europa. The, it's the second time. And what's interesting, I guess, they pointed out is that the jets are still there. In fact, they may be bigger and they are in the same place. There may be a hot spot associated with it. Now, Europa isn't getting enough heat from the sun to keep its uh, lakes or its ocean liquid. All the heat comes from internal sources. And in the case of Europa, most of the heating is coming from tidal sources, that is, its gravitational interaction with other bodies. Now, many people have seen these diagrams showing the, uh, the synchronicity, the resonance between Io, Europa and Ganymede, how they're in a 1 to 2 to 4 resonance. While Io is closest in and gets full-on hot lava experience, a Europa is a little further out and the energy density is enough to drive cryovolcanism. That means uh, instead of rocks, we have ice. Instead of lava, we have water. And in this case, you can fly your spaceship through this pretty powerful jet and nothing happens. There's two types of jets you'll see. One looks more like a water spout and the other looks more like a high power water jet. Now the heating basically occurs because the moons are in eccentric orbits. When they get slightly closer at perigove, the tidal forces are higher so the moon gets stretched more. And then as they fly out towards apogeove, the tidal stresses get lower and they return to a spherical shape. And that uh, basically is squeezing the moon and creating internal stresses. Now it's important to note that the eccentricity is kept high enough by the interactions between these three moons. If they were on their own, this uh, thermal, the stretching and squeezing would dissipate the eccentricity and result in a purely circular orbit. But also, in the case of Europa, there's some good evidence that the moon's axis of rotation is off axis by about 0.1 degrees, which may seem like a tiny amount, but the gravitational interactions may generate way more energy than through a simple squeezing system. Anyway, yeah, in the SRV in Elite, of course, you can jump into these little uh, spouts and they will kick you high into the sky. Uh, you have little rockets, of course, on your spacecraft, or, or sorry, on your rover to help you control it. I've only made it up about one kilometer here, not really pushing my luck too much. If you do keep coming up, you will come down a lot harder, so uh, be careful if you want to bring your SRV back in one piece. The more mundane water spouts... Well, I'm not even sure this one has any energy left, and I think it's just dying on me. Yeah, there it goes. It's, it's barely working and it won't give me any lift. No, you want to find those powerful, violent ones so you can really go for a, a flight in it. So, here's one we found earlier. Look at that one. That is surely going to send me on a serious trip. Ooh, if I, if I lose an SRV, who cares? I can afford it. Ah, there we go. Okay. So, using these jets, you can actually get some semblance of control. And if you pitch the nose down, you can get uh, lateral velocity. The only thing is, I haven't figured out how to get any roll control on these SRVs. Maybe I'm missing something, but... 
If you pitch the nose down and it isn't straight, then you're going to pick up velocity that's going kind of sideways. But look at my speed there. I'm getting up to like 180, 200 meters per second, which of course isn't particularly survivable when you hit the ground at that speed. So let's move on to Enceladus. Did I say Enceladus? That sounds a lot like Enceladus. Enceladus is how the pros say it. It's not quite as embarrassing as mispronouncing Uranus. Anyway, Enceladus is a lot smaller than Europa. It is maybe uh, 500 kilometers diameter, which means it's about one sixth of the uh, diameter of Europa. And of course, that means 36 times less surface area, which, uh, yeah, it has a whole lot less mass, a whole lot less ocean space, but it has had these really well-observed jets. And when I say well-observed, they were discovered by the Cassini spacecraft, which had on board a mass spectrometer that was designed to look for at, at the atmosphere of Titan and maybe dust grains in the vicinity of Saturn. Back when the mission was designed, they certainly had no consideration that they might be flying the spacecraft through jets of water ice coming off Enceladus. And that's what they ended up doing. Now, with the help of the mass spectrometer, they definitely, uh, definitively identified the plumes as being water-based. They also identified carbon and nitrogen products, which is pretty important because carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen are the key, uh, you know, first kind of four key molecules used in life. You're also really going to want some phosphorus and sulfur if you're going to really start talking about life signatures, but it's a good start. However, today's press conference was specifically talking about the identification of neutral hydrogen within the water ice. That means there is basically hydrogen dissolved in the water. There is some chemical process under the ice which is generating uh, nuclear, nu sorry, neutral molecular hydrogen, which is then, of course, bubbling up to the surface and escaping in these jets. This is really interesting. It means there's some sort of uh, chemical energy in there, some energy source that can be used potentially to sustain some sort of complex, perhaps biological process in there. Right now, it's more likely to be hot rocks interacting with water, rather like we see on the Earth's ocean floor. The ocean floor on Earth is pretty barren as far as life is concerned. But when you get one near these hydrothermal vents, they become veritable oases of life in the deep dark of the ocean. Cut off from sunlight, this source of energy are these vents rather than photosynthesis. This vent doesn't have life, but it does have a, a little crystalline fragment I could harvest. Let me try and get in over there. Unfortunately, to oh, and the thing has changed from being a super powerful jet to a rather more benign water jet. Well, I won't be going for a ride on that anytime soon. Oh, yeah, I mean, I know I died on the last one, but interesting fact I got up to over 200 meters per second on that other uh, on Europa. Well, 200 meters per second is above the orbital velocity of Enceladus. And I think the jet appears to have kicked that fragment away, so... Oh, but it's turned back into a powerful jet. Time to go for a ride and see if I can actually take this little uh, rover into orbit. Yeah, as I mentioned, Enceladus is pretty small, so its orbital velocity is about 170 meters per second. Its escape velocity is 240. So I should be able to challenge that. If I do this just right, that means pitching forwards about 45 degrees to get lift and lateral velocity and hoping that, well, hoping that I get fast enough before the physics kills me. And there we go. Now get this pointed the right way and start thrusting. There we go. Okay. Get nose down and then start watching this picking up speed here. There we go. It says negative. I have no idea how to measure velocity, but it does look... I think I'm going to go this way. So. The press conference also talked about future missions to potentially investigate these targets. Now, right now, there is the Europa Clipper mission, which does look like a dead cert to happen in the future, in the next uh, in the next decade. However, 
you know, there's Europa and there's Enceladus, and there's a lot of people that really want to take a look, a closer look at Enceladus, because that has been studied far more. When Galileo went, this Galileo spacecraft went there, it didn't have the instrumentation and it didn't have the bandwidth. It was crippled. So the amount of data it was able to collect on the on Europa was really insufficient to actually determine composition and everything. So there's the argument that Enceladus perhaps is a better bet looking for life since we've already positively identified most of the materials. On the other hand, Europa has about 40 times as much water volume as Enceladus. So, uh, if life were to form, it would be more likely to uh, more likely to have formed in that volume than on Enceladus. Personally, I think we should just send missions to both of those. Anyway, if you were paying attention, you'll notice my lateral velocity got high enough while I was still going upwards that I should have been able to go into orbit. But the gravitational attraction of Enceladus never let us go. It didn't care about centrifugal force and rotating frames and things like that. So, yeah, I eventually end up flying across the surface sideways at about 200 meters per second. And we all know how this is going to end. So glad to be back making videos. Until the next time, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.